Hi everybody, this is Scott Dudley from SaaS Startup Stories and today my special guest is Ed Vincent who's based in Austin, Texas. Ed is the founder and CEO of Festival Pass, which is the world's first live event subscription service across music, film, food and wine, theatre, tech and innovation and more. Welcome to the show, Ed. You're ready to rock and roll. I am. Thanks, Scott. Appreciate it. Perfect. Let's get stuck into it. Uh, so let's start off with your background and what initially got you interested in starting a SaaS company. Sure. So, um, you know, there's context to everything. And I've been an entrepreneur for over 20 years, um, banker up until uh, 1999, prior to jumping into the e-commerce world. So I've been through the internet 1.0 and 2.0 and all the other pieces that you can imagine. But yeah. um, I had an e-commerce company back my first uh, startup, sold that in 2001. Uh, and then I had an agency, about a 70 person uh, experiential agency throughout the 2000s. Uh, and in that process, we had done a lot of work with uh, help launching a bunch of film festivals, uh, bringing big brands to, to large concerts and, and music festivals. Um, so I had a, lot, a love of live events. Uh, fast forward a little bit, I had a, a SaaS uh, startup for the franchise multi-unit space that I sold in 2014. And then I spent a, a good five years, um, I had a data consultancy and a software platform in the entertainment space. Uh, and when you take all of those pieces and put them together, I saw a big opportunity for the live event space. Um, so a data-driven marketplace for live events. Uh, and uh, I even spent some time as the interim chief data officer for a subscription uh, movie pass called movie pass uh, and learned a lot about what to do and not to do when building subscription businesses. Yeah, so this is like the only uh, business of its kind uh, currently, isn't it? It is, it is. So it's, a, it's, it's an innovative, different way to approach ticketing, um, but not to replace the traditional primary ticketing services, more to provide the consumer a more social frictionless community in order to be able to engage in more live events. Okay. All right. So uh, did you borrow VC money to launch your SaaS company or did you bootstrap it instead? Tell us a bit about how you got Festival Pass off the ground in the beginning. Sure. So, so it's always, uh, again, a nuanced question because uh, in previous businesses, I did raise venture capital uh, as well as private equity money and numerous other uh, variations with Festival Pass specifically. Um, I had written a strategy doc that I published in a, in a in medium. If anybody knows uh, medium that your listeners, it tends to be in the States that a lot of tech people use as a publishing platform. Um, but uh, it was titled, uh, you know, zero to hundred million dollars with no venture capital money. Uh, and I laid out my strategy on how I'm going to do that. Yep. And uh, we're, we're halfway there. So, so we're not halfway there in revenue yet, but we're, we're halfway there in the process through which we hope to get there. And what I mean by that is I raised some seed capital initially from some friendly people. Um, being an entrepreneur for a long period of time, I have friends that are also entrepreneurs. And so we raised a few hundred thousand dollars just to get started. Uh, and then I did take an investment from a radio group, uh, the third largest radio group here in the US, and they provided just a little bit of cash, but mostly media. And that media is what, which is one of your other questions, I think, in the podcast is how do we get some of our first customers? But uh, so, so the answer is, is no, we did not take venture capital. Uh, I'm hoping to not have to. And there's a bunch of other unique and amazing strategies we're embarking on in order to not have to, including crowd, crowd financing. Yeah, obviously it's, uh, it's a lot better if you don't have to, yeah. All right, so um, tell me a bit about the Festival Pass product and what exactly it provides to its users and if they're pricing tiers. Sure, yeah, so, so we look at it as a marketplace for live events and, and what that means to most people is a marketplace is, provides two sides to to, uh, to a market, right? So there's the consumers that, that want to attend live events and then yep. there's the, the providers that own, manage or promote live events or venues. So I always use the analogy, we call ourselves like Airbnb meets ClassPass. If you know what, I obviously you know Airbnb, I'm not sure yep. what ClassPass. <laughs> um, but, but the idea being is we're providing a marketplace for this disaggregated market of tens of thousands of event owners to come together while at the same time providing a more um, consumer friendly way for individuals to attend those events. They pay a subscription fee 
anywhere from nine to ninety nine dollars a month, and uh, and that those are that's your answer to the tiers. We have a nine dollar tier, twenty nine dollar tier, forty nine, seventy nine, and ninety nine. And for each tier, the the consumer receives credits. So it's a credit based model. And then once they get those credits, they can then use those credits to go to thousands of different live events we have on the platform. Yeah. All right, so um, obviously at the moment with uh, the coronavirus sort of um, striking everyone down, um, uh, is there any live events in the US at the moment? Like, I, I don't think there's any here in Australia, but um, how has that sort of affected things? Yeah, so, so we launched this company right before uh, the pandemic happened. And luckily we were able to secure some of those early on investments to, oh, yeah. to allow us a little patience to be able to build um, what we're building. And there's a silver lining as well to, to all bad things. And um, silver lining from a business perspective is we spent the last six to nine months building infrastructure, building scale, making sure our data infrastructure is the right, building relationships. Um, so we think we're very well positioned for the other side of COVID. And that's what we've been focusing on is making sure that as events start coming back, we are in a great position to to capitalize on the, the huge pent up demand. Um, oh, to answer, yeah. I was gonna say to answer your question, there are, there are a select few events happening, uh, especially in the Southern states where it's a little warmer and there's a lot more outdoor space, um, but it's nowhere near what will be in a, in a few months. Yeah, that's a good point. I mean, once this eventually blows over, the demand for live events is going to be massive because people have been missing them for you know the best part of a year. And um, yeah, the, the demand will be huge. Yeah, I, I agree. I mean, I, I give, give a great example myself is I went to a comedy show in Austin uh, last week where I typically wouldn't just go to some random comic I never heard of in a place where you know there's only 20 other people in the room because of social distancing. But I just wanted to go to any event. <laughs> yeah, I'm like, sure, twenty bucks, I'm in. I don't care what what I'm going to see as long as somebody's up on stage doing something and I'm sitting having a drink. Yeah, well, I know for me personally, I missed a couple of concerts because of it. There's a Kiss concert and also an Iron Maiden concert. I wasn't happy about it, but but what can you do? Yeah. All right. So, uh, how many employees do you have at the moment with Festival Pass? So we're mostly a distributed company, remote. We were remote before, so it's a good thing. So we have about 15 employees in various functions uh, and then contractors and all the above to be able to scale as we need to. And they sort of spread around the world or mostly in the U.S.? Uh, mostly U.S., but we have, uh, you know, some of my UIX, UX people initially uh, were nomads in Bali. Uh, so a lot, a lot of digital nomads from North America in Australia also ended up in Bali. Oh, okay. Um, have some developers in Lisbon. Um, I have another development team down in Monterey, Mexico. Um, so definitely throughout spaces um, and then spread across the U.S. as well. California, New York, Florida. Yeah. Right. Okay, cool. All right. So without giving away all your secrets, uh, what's your product roadmap for the next 12 to 18 months? Yeah, so we're, we're building out features. Um, there's a lot that we're excited about. And, you know, again, everything's about the overall mission, right? So it's making, yeah. making a frictionless, uh, bigger community that makes it easier for people to go to events, mostly, especially in the States, most ticketing platforms are just transactional, right? So you go, you get a ticket, you pay your fee for that ticket, which nobody likes. And then, uh, and then that's it. You just get your ticket. There's no, there's no sense of brand. There's no sense of community. And I think what we're really trying to build is the the ability for people to interact and interact and connect within our environment. So a couple of the features that that are on the roadmap that will be happening very soon is, uh, you know, when you add different people through your social networks as a member, um, you'll be able to see, you know, which members are going to which events. So you might log on to a specific ah. event and say, hey, oh, 17 of my friends are already going to this event. That's interesting. I want to go too. Um, that's just one example. Um, that's really cool. Yeah. It just it gives that sense of wanting to be there and, and wanting to share. Yeah, absolutely. Um, we'll be adding other ways to spend your credits. So uh, we're integrating a, a hotel product that enables 60,000 different hotels throughout the world that you can book using your credits at a 30, 40% discount than you would, you can find them anywhere else. So really membership benefits for being part of the community. 
Okay, cool. So um, if we start talking about customer acquisition, um, what would you say are the most successful customer acquisition channels and, and how did you find them? Sure. So the truth is, is that the most successful has been just paid social um, in terms of buying ads to highly targeted yeah. uh, demographics on Facebook and Instagram mostly. Um, we've tested a few other platforms, uh, still want to push forward with a little more testing on TikTok. Um, but at scale to date, Instagram and Facebook have been the best. Um, and with our partnership with a large radio group, you know, we run radio ads and uh, other digital uh, media. But again, paid social is absolutely so far has been the easiest to predict uh, and be able to scale. What about Google Ads though, with people searching for events online on, on Google, did, that didn't really work for you? Or? Uh, we are currently doing it, um, but I'm seeing the cost per lead coming in higher on search. Ah, I see. So everything's, everything's about math for me as a data guy. Yeah, yeah, I, I see, uh, yeah. But, uh, but I think that will change over time. Um, so what I think has happened is in most of the kind of call it last six, nine months, this search volume for specifically people searching for events has gone down. Yeah, true. Volume's gone down, there's less targeted market of people. So you're paying a higher price to get those uh, targeted people into, into your funnel. Yeah. Uh, but I believe in a few months as that traffic searching for every event you can possibly think of starts picking up, mm. uh, I think you'll be able to acquire a lot more that way. Yeah, it makes sense. Okay. All right, so then on the other side with churn, how do you approach reducing churn and retaining paying customers? Yeah, I think a big piece of that is uh, back to the original uh, vision of community, right? The making yep. it people feel that um, they want to be a part of it because they're getting either other benefits or their friends are also a part of it. Mm -hmm. um, so that's one. The, the other is we're, we're very liberal so far and hopefully, hopefully we'll stay that way of allowing people to carry their credits month to month. So there's been subscription businesses that say, hey, you get 30 credits or you get X amount of things to do. And if you don't use them in the month, gone, now you got to start over again. Yeah, um, I, I hate that personally. Yeah. Yeah, everybody hates that, right? So, <laughs> yeah. um, so we built the business model to make sure we can still have gross margin positive on every transaction. Ah, uh, okay. But if you have 100 credits and you don't use them, yeah. next month, 100 credits, right? So roll them over it's like a bank account for us it's good it's because once you have a bank account in our bank you're eventually going to use them so uh for us it's fine we're, we're okay with that and for the consumer they're happy so they never feel like you know hey why am i wasting all this i want to quit yeah okay makes sense excellent all right um what are the most common mistakes that inexperienced SaaS founders make in your opinion and, and from your experience Huh. Um, yeah, I, I guess product market fit, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of a cliche that everybody says, but at the end of the day, um, you know, when you, when you're in a silo thinking that you got a really good idea, um, you know, it, it doesn't matter unless the customers also think it's a really good idea. So I think it's about really getting out and testing early, trying it out, making sure people are responding, seeing if it's even something that the marketplace even needs or wants. Yeah, and I guess also you could niche down based on, um, you know, customer feedback and, and the data that you're receiving as well. Um, if you can see an opportunity to, to aim for a specific niche as well. Yeah, I agree. So yeah. even in our world, we're, we're cross genre. So we have music, film, food and wine, stuff like that. So we start realizing that different demographics, you might have a strong millennial demographic for an EDM festival. But, you know, Kiss or uh, Iron Maiden, like you want to go to, is going to be a slightly older demographic. Yeah, uh, that's true. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, exactly right. I, I, you know, as well as food and wine festivals, which, you know, tend to be the 40 plus set. Yeah. Yeah, agree. All right. What was the biggest challenge that you had to face when you first started Festival Pass and how did you go about overcoming it? Um, I mean, barring COVID, uh, which is a you challenge. Are. Yeah, true. <laughs> but just assuming not COVID, I think the biggest challenge um, initially was to just have the, um, how do I say, the confidence that it was worth pursuing this channel, right? So again, 
It's about having ideas. And until, until I was really testing those ideas with many people in the marketplace and getting the feedback on how the entire ecosystem works, um, you know, it was, it was a little slightly less confident until, you know, just decided to go, go all in and give it a shot uh, and learning from all the different players in the marketplace of why it will work. And just for me, it was just really building that confidence over time. So um, I'm, I'm more confident now than I ever was uh, of how, why this model is going to be a key piece to the evolution of live events. And I'm getting that feedback from everybody I talked to. Perfect. Okay, so what are your favorite online tools and platforms that you use to run your business? Well, the simple answer to that is Slack. Uh, it's gotta be the easiest way for us all in a distributed work environment to communicate. Yeah. Um, that's been super helpful. Um, I'm trying to remember the name of it, but there's a, a little software tool where you can take videos uh, while you, know, you walk somebody through a project that you created. Is that Loom? Uh, Loom, exactly, yeah. yeah, uh, yeah. So, like, just even in the process during the early stages of UI, UX, and development, having people at different time zones, you know, spend a five-minute Loom video to tell me what they were doing, took took away hours of questions, which was great. Yeah, and that's that's mostly from the development side, and then uh, you know, I guess on the um, the consumer side, um, just data and analytics has always been my game. Just trying to make sure, you know, I take the emotion out of it. And even if I like a creative a lot and it performs worse than the creative that looks ugly, just admit that other people might like something different than me. Uh, yeah. So I'm deep into Google Analytics. I'm deep into, we have a partnership with a company called Habu, which is a, which is a, a, a very deep analytics uh, AI in kind of clustering company. Cool. Okay. So what are you curious about or researching right now regarding SaaS or, or software? Yeah, I mean, in terms of, uh, I apologize, the question, do you mean in terms of uh, types of products or in terms of your strategies? Oh, just anything related to tech, I guess. It doesn't have to actually be specifically software, but uh, just tech related. Yeah, I think for me is uh, I'm, I'm interested in the gamification of certain tiers and products. So, um, you know, one of the things we're building out is we, we have different tiers. Apologize for that little ring. Um, we have different tiers within our uh, product that is pricing tiers, but then we're, we're rolling out branded tiers. So whether it's a corporation or an association or an artist or a band, they can actually have quote unquote badges, if you will, some kind of tier that gives you ah, yeah. So the idea, I can have a $49 a month tier, but I pay an extra $3 to, to be a kiss, to be a kiss brand and an extra $4 to be, you know, I'm trying to think of ideas, uh, you know, some, some other benefit um, so that I'm, I'm voting what my special interest is and I'm kind of customizing my tier that gives me thousands of different options, but it's really only based on a few pricing tiers. Interesting. Okay. All right, so just to wrap up, where can people go to find out more about Festival Pass? Sure, so the easiest place is festivalpass.com. That's the easiest way to go. Sign up for free for a free account. Um, we are on Instagram and Facebook. Just look for Festival Pass and you'll find us. Um, you know, myself, uh, mostly on the business side, I'm on LinkedIn, but, uh, but other than that, that, that's mostly what it is. Excellent. All right, then, thanks for being on the show, Ed. I appreciate your time. Sounds great. Thanks, Scott. Okay, thanks.